Exactly. And it's like, like I said, an easier read. So I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. So, or go through a couple of things that I thought were very interesting. Let's just talk about, you said in the book, it takes eight positive encounters to change someone's negative impression of you. So can you just talk about that? And how did you, how did, who figured that out? How do you know this to be true? Please just expand yeah. on that. Uh, well, we need to dial it back to first impressions. Okay. And first impressions, some research says two minutes, some research says not even a second, mm -hmm. right? So somebody's forming a first impression of you within like, within a second um, of seeing you. So that's before you even speak, before you say anything. Mm -hmm. And usually, we, I mean, we want to make good first impressions. That's why it's so important. Uh, and and whenever we make a negative, let's say if we have, if somebody forms a negative impression of us, then it takes it's varying. So some people have said it takes a certain number of hours, uh, but generally speaking, they, everybody points to some Harvard research study that, you know, that doesn't really exist that I haven't right. been able to find. <laughs> and, yeah. but generally speaking, they say it's, it takes eight positive encounters to change the mind of somebody's negative, negative impression of you. All right, guys, this is a fun episode we're doing today because I have Sarah Jane Ho, otherwise known as Sarah Jane. That's how you go by who wrote a book called Mind Your Manners. She has uh, the same name for her Netflix show, uh, which is now not going into se season two. We don't know yet. You don't know There's yet. only been season one. There's only been mm -hmm. season one. But she is a renowned etiquette expert. I can't wait to ask you my questions. And we are going to get really into all this stuff. Sarah, thank you, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Thank you for having me. I love talking about habits and hustle. Well, I'm glad because we're going to be talking all about habits and hustle, <laughs> but how to do it properly. I mean, I got to tell you, I'm actually kind of nervous to have you on. I told you that when you walked in because um, I don't know. I think maybe I need like I need to hire you because there's a couple areas of my life that probably I'm not the most uh, groomed and well uh my etiquette may be a little bit lacking. So this could be like can't, a can't wait to find out. Yeah, well, here we go. <laughs> uh, first of all, what makes you... The qu first question I have is, give me your background. What makes you an expert in etiquette? Because you, do you go to school for that? I know that you, you created a school for it. But how do, you, how do we know... Like, Why is it what you say is the, is the right way? Yeah, that's a great question. So I grew up... Um, by the time I was... By the age of 14 years old... I'd grown up in Papua New Guinea, the UK, Hong Kong, and Exeter, New Hampshire, because I went to boarding school at Phillips Exeter. And so I was very much a third culture kid. You know, I was always like between really different cultures and trying to figure out how to fit in, right? Which is kind of the one thing about like being human, right? Human connection and belonging. And so what, so it was very much a survival tool for me to be in different microcultures and figure out, okay, how do I how do I fit in? What are the codes of conduct here? What is the, how are people dressed? What is the slang used? And later on, when I graduated from Harvard Business School in 2012, I, well, first I went to a Swiss finishing school, which is, uh, it was where women used to go back in the day because we didn't have the opportunity to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so women would finish their education at these finishing schools. It's mostly in Europe, but in the, in the America, you have charm school, Right, you have etiquette schools very much in, in America too back back in the day. And uh, and now, you know, women are emancipated, women can vote, women go to university. So we no longer go to these finishing schools. But for me, going to finishing school and starting a finishing school in China for women, because we don't do kids, we do adult women, it was something, it was an opportunity I wanted to combine what I was passionate about with what I felt was a market need because no other country has been like China where they've gone through so much change in such a short amount of time. Like when you think about the industrial revolution, right? That alone took 150 years to play out in Europe. Mm, yeah. And then you have like the services revolution, the technological revolution. In China, you've had industrial services technological in 30 years. So that's a huge amount of change in a really short amount of time because China only opened up with economic reforms in 1978. So you have all these people with newfound riches, right? And then, but then trying to figure out how to navigate the world with confidence. And for me, when I was growing up, my mother was very much a, she was a role model you know, and, and she was always hosting in the house, creating magical moments between friends. Christmas would be you know, dozens of people at our house. 
And then I lost it to cancer when I was 21 years old. And my life really changed. I'm an only child. My dad didn't entertain in the same way on his own. Uh, and my home went yeah. from being, you know, really warm and loving and busy to very cold and lonely and empty until I realized, because I'm a Sagittarius uh, and I love, you know, being with friends and organizing, you know, social events, um, I realized I could continue her legacy, right, in, in something that I also enjoyed doing with etiquette. And so that's why in 2012, I moved to Beijing and I founded my etiquette school. Wow. So let me ask you, because you were saying something that was interesting. So the U.S. or North America has charm schools. The Euro European, the European version would be considered finishing schools. This is actually very timely because uh, some very close friends of mine are from. I have actually a lot of friends from London, and they are this one girl. Her name's Amanda. I'm going to give her a shout out. She is all about etiquette and manners and. She has like impeccable manners and she always teases me about certain things. Um, and so, you know, I find it's very European, much, it's a very European thing. I haven't seen that same type of, um, I don't know. Well, you wouldn't in California. Let me just put it this way. You wouldn't in California. Yeah, I mean, look how, like it's, you would never, so it's, it's very culture, it's very culture based, isn't it? Like it's not. Well, you tell me, you said something. Yeah, so California is very casual, right? It's it's convenient, it's casual, it's it has it doesn't have the same sort of depth of history as the North as New England, right? Yeah. And whereas like New England and then the South, mm -hmm. so the South is a lot of focus on charm school. That was a big thing. For, and debutantes, yeah. right, coming out, their debut into society. So America is so big that you're right. It is very culturally different. So, right. So now that you said that, you're right. Like very, because, you know, like, again, my friends who are, who are very Southern, they say their children say Miss Jennifer. Like, it's true. Like, it's very specific to the culture and where you actually live. Like that is, so, so then let's say, is it also, I guess it's not just a socioeconomic thing because in the South, no matter where you are socioeconomically, your manners and the way you speak to people and how you address people is very different than how you would, like you said, in California or in different cultures. So that is actually quite interesting. But, you know, back in the day, it would be. So, for example, in Europe, uh, if if you were from a good family, then you'd be sent to, actually, if you're a man, you'd be sent on a grand tour of Europe to go study the arts, to go see, let's say, like, you know, to, to go to go to Italy, to go to Greece, to go here and there, uh, to finish your education, yeah, right? Yeah. Women would be sent to finishing schools to prepare them for life as a hostess. Di Princess Diana, for example, went to finishing school in Switzerland. Right. And so, what did you what do you learn there? Give me an example of what would you what would what did they teach you? How yeah. was a day, a day? Give me a day in the life of what you do. Yeah. So I was there um, for two two and a little bit. Two, it's two months, a little over two months. And it's a very intensive course schedule, you know, from morning till late afternoon. The course itself is called a hostess course. And there were a lot of modules and everything from dining to dressing to table conversation, greetings and introductions, a lot of country learnings because etiquette is contextual. So right. there's no right or wrong in etiquette. It really, it's contextual. It depends on where you are, who you're with. For example, for example, um, Let's say if I give a gift to you and, and we're in the West, right? You would open the gift in front of me to show importance to the gift. You would read the note in front of me. You would make a big fuss of it, right? And, and show gratitude. Now in, in Asia, if I gave you a gift and if you opened it up straight away, it would show greediness and that you have no self-control. So in Asia, if I receive a gift, I put it aside. I don't make a fuss of it, I just put it aside. And then maybe on my own is when I'll open it up and then, you know, later on, then I'll thank, thank the person who gave it to me. Do they teach you in finishing school context like that? So they'll say like in the West, this is what happens in Asia. This is what happens. Do they break it down? So when I went to Swiss finishing school in Switzerland, it was very European based, but they would talk about different countries on their own. So they'd be country modules. Now I actually tweaked a lot of the, um, of the core schedule to for my local market for China. And everything we teach, we do what you just asked about, which is a Chinese and Western comparison. 
And because I spent my life being between both extremely different cultures, it comes very naturally for me to say, well, this is how it's done in China, how we do it in China. This is how we've done it in the UK or in Europe. And this is how it's done in America. Like does, so, but does it ever, do people ever get, like, I, I kind of joked around, like I got nervous when I have, well, I am nervous because even the way you're sitting and the way you're so, you're so polite and you know, you, you kind of know your P's and Q's. It makes the other p- person feel more uncomfortable. Does anyone ever get uncomfortable with you? So here's the thing, you? if, if you're nervous around me, then I'm doing something wrong. Oh, I'm not nervous around you, actually. No, that's, no, that's what that's funny, so, though. You're yeah, so, not making me nervous. Yeah. It's just the fact that you have that title in front of your name. Yes. And, and because to me, etiquette, and this is what I'm, how I'm trying to redefine etiquette, etiquette, people think that etiquette is, it's really, they think it's very traditional that it should be taught by, you know, a a strict middle-aged lady with her hair in a bun, something and wearing a suit. Uh, And, and to me, etiquette is just about, it's about putting people around you at ease. That is really Mm. what the spirit of etiquette is that, that people feel comfortable around you and then you feel comfortable around them. And it, that goes again back to human connection, human belonging, which is what makes us human. Because it's funny because when you think about it, the people who are the most, the best manners, the most highly, I guess they seem, they come across conservative or much more stuffy than the average person, right? Like, so that, that, so you have, there has to be a good balance of understanding human nature and like EQ, like having a good EQ to know how to make the other person feel comfortable. Yes, exactly. EQ and knowing how to read the air is what is what I talk about yeah. in my book. Yeah. Right. When you go into a room and when you meet a new person, you can kind of pick up on the vibes, I yeah. guess, is what you'd say in American culture. Yeah. <laughs> in China, we'd call it the T Q I, the energy. Yeah. We read energy. And and so even for me, let's say if I'm let's say we're sitting at a dining table, I'm speaking with you like this. Actually, out of this corner of my eye, I can see who's bored, who's shy, who's playing on their phone, who needs a top up for their wine glass, right? All these right. things. So having that self-awareness and sensitivity. And I think part of it is also, you know, the reason why I decided to target adults for my finishing school is because I believe that it it begins with upbringing Mm -hmm. and the most beautiful gift a parent can give their child is good manners. I totally agree. I think one of the ugliest things is when a child has bad manners and they're at the table manners. Like I I always notice those things As, as I joke around about myself. I try to be much, I'm very cognizant of those things for my own children because it does, it looks, it, 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 it doesn't present well about, it says a lot about the person and then the individual, but sometimes don't you have to start young? Because if you're starting at, you're saying you're starting with people, young adults, so then they can teach their children, right? Actually, I'd start with mothers. So, so yeah, so my, my finishing school, it's for ladies and many are mothers. It's like 90% of my clients and mothers so they can then teach their children yeah right because they want to be role models for their children and to me that is the most important thing and i do have some young adults like actually sometimes i have mothers and daughters because i have a hostess course for for married women and a debutante course for unmarried women so sometimes i'll have a mother in hostess and then her daughter in my debutante class okay so tell me i'm so curious about this okay so it's still happening you still have this finishing Mm -hmm. school yeah in china yes okay how many people are enrolled like, give, how long is the course? Is it a year? Do they live there? Like, not really. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. So I opened my Beijing school in 2013, followed by a Shanghai school in 2015. Uh, and then, so at some, at some point I was between two cities. My co-founder, Rebecca, who's my co-founder for my finishing school to this day, she's based in Beijing. And actually she does, because now I'm traveling a lot and mm-hmm. she she does most of the teaching now. Uh, in during during COVID, China had pretty stringent lockdowns, mm-hmm. and and during that time, it was just impossible to hold a class to teach, and so I closed down both physical schools, and now we're so actually what we do now is when we, whenever we have classes, we have them in the Waldorf Astoria in Shanghai, for example, or we work with different. We'll just choose different venues and different hotels to have to hold our courses in. And how long is the course? Well, the hostess course is ten days long. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, and then, and then the debutant course is eight days long, but we also have weekend courses and we also work with a lot of luxury brands to hold etiquette workshops for their VIPs. So for their customers. I love this. So you teach, like, would, would you do like how to set a table? table Absolutely. Table? We do. Like what are the top, to, what are British the top afternoon ones? tea okay. t- table manners is the most popular and most practical course. Yeah. I would imagine. Right. Cause in China, everybody uses chopsticks. Right. So, right. And, and and even Western dining is a really new concept. 
really? that really yeah. just came about. I mean, in the 90s, it was a very basically no Western restaurants in China. And then in the 2000s, a couple started springing up. Now, every Michelin chef is going to China. Well, you know, it's true. Okay. Yes. I, I, you know what I love? Yes. I, I, I agree with you and I know that to be true. What I actually love about how you present or how you, even in your book, it's kind of like to me, like a coffee table book where you don't have to read it all at once. Like it's very, it's an easy read and there's so many great tips. Like you, there's a dating section, there's a table manner, like there's, there's different sections. So like you can just, pull and just read a little bit and then put it down and go back. It, it's not, it's not sequential like that. Right. Exactly. And it, it's, it's a combination of anecdotes, right? a lot little, of little anecdotes. pro tips, right? So each section is maybe one to two pages. Exactly. And it's like, like I said, an easier read. So I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. So, or go through a couple of things that I thought were very interesting. Let's just talk about, you said in the book, it takes eight positive encounters to change someone's negative impression of you. So can you just talk about that and how did you, how did, who figured that out? How do you know this to be true? Please just expand yeah. on that. Uh, well, we need to dial it back to first impressions. Okay. And first impressions, some research says two minutes, some research says not even a second, mm -hmm. right? So somebody's forming a first impression of you within like, within a second um, of seeing you. So that's before you even speak, before you say anything. Mm -hmm. And Usually, I mean, we want to make good first impressions. That's why it's so important. Uh, and and whenever we make a negative, let's say if we have, if somebody forms a negative impression of us, then it takes, it's varying. So some people have said it takes a certain number of hours, uh, but generally speaking, they, everybody points to some Harvard research study that, you know, that doesn't really exist that I haven't right. been able to find. <laughs> and, yeah. but generally speaking, they say it's, it takes eight positive encounters to change the mind of somebody's negative, negative impression of you. So if, if you know that then, right. Cause then it's, it's much better to make a good first impression rather than to, you know, than to make a bad impression and then have to work really hard to turn that around. Well, I thought also you, you, you talk about, and this is, I, I, a lot of the things are, I think a lot of it also, if you have a higher EQ and you kind of are street smart, you kind of know this instinctually, yeah. but it's a great reminder, but you know, a last, your last impression is actually more important than your first impression because that's what they you leave with. And it's true because when you think about it, no matter how much great stuff you've done, it's always the last thing that people always remember, right? So it, I think, and there's also a name for it. And I don't remember that. Oh yeah. What was it? It's, um, oh gosh. The law of the, the last look. Oh, the, the recency effect. The recency effect. Yeah. Yes. Which is, so, and so to me, like, let's talk about that. Cause I think that is, people don't sometimes re remember that to be true. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, you could have been doing, you could have been performing consistently well at work, for example. And if you screw up, you know, the most recent project, then that's the recency effect, right? In people's minds, oh, okay, well, but you, she screwed up the last project. Right. So the way to work around that is to then actively make good on a lot of projects in order to, you know, sort of move that, move the, move the bad project further down the line. Well, the way I see it is that that would be like the eight positive encounters or positive things. Like you have to work, like you said, like extra, extra hard to, to kind of compensate for those things. Absolutely. Right. But I always, I always think about that. Like if I'm leaving a party or a meeting, yes, like you, you may like the first impression, of course, that's people have like a, they, they automatically like have a, a thought of who you are, but if you leave strong, mm -hmm. I think that's more important because an eye contact to me. Is and you would, really yeah. Important. And you'd be surprised how many young people these days can't I, I contact it's it's an issue well how do you teach how can you even teach etiquette and manners to uh a generation when they're not even socializing anymore they're always on their phone it's tech everything is technology driven they've they've lost even the baseline of socialization or interaction so how how could you teach people better etiquette you then just like do you shift and pivot to then technology, like, you know, app etiquette? How do you, uh, how do you correspond? How do you socialize online? Is that what, are you learning those things to then help the new generation because of where we are in, in the world? 
Well, I think all of us at all generations are learning those things. Yeah. We grapple with the digital world. And that's why at the end of every chapter, whether it's you know my social chapter, work, career, love and relationships, food and dining, at the end, there's always a subchapter. So I end every chapter with a subchapter that talks about the digital etiquette for these things. And I, I think that you know, my my Netflix show, Mind Your Manners, was delayed because of COVID. So production was delayed because of COVID. It ended up coming out out of COVID, which was end of 2022. But in many right. ways, I felt that that was more timely because yeah. coming out of COVID, everybody, right, had a bit of social anxiety. Our social skills are a bit rusty. We're feeling more isolated and alone than ever. And you have we have this whole generation, like you said, where, I mean, they're going through a mental health crisis. And, and it absolutely... Yeah is in line with social media and, 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 and the digital age. You're right. So then, right. Cause people were like, well, hiding think, behind screens, hiding behind screens, or like they can talk on a zoom for a very finite period of time, even dating though. Like, let's just talk about the relationship aspect, you know, like now that's how people are meeting people is through online apps. So you talk, you have a whole, you have a whole area in the book about this. Can you just give us some proper etiquette for like, dating 101 in etiquette? Because there's so many crazy things that are happening with how people are communicating, what, the, what should they say? How much should they, you know, how much should they say, you know, like, are you supposed to wait three days before you sleep with somebody? Are you supposed to do this? Are you, like, there's so much noise. Can you just break it down to the top five things that people should do? well or do do when they're dating online? Yeah. So the top five things people should be mindful of when dating, whether online or offline is first of all, for, for your first date, keep it casual, right? Keep it casual and have it so that you can control the time frame. Mm -hmm. right? Don't sit down for a three course dinner, have a coffee, take a walk in the park, because if it's not working out, don't waste your time. Time is the most valuable thing in everybody's life right now. Right. And then, so you can control the time and then exit when you need to exit. Secondly, I would say the first three days are getting to know someone, but don't go too heavy. Don't, don't, you sh like wait till date three to see if you're actually, when you get to know somebody, you see if you're attracted to somebody. Cause by date three, you kind of should know if you're attracted or not before digging into all of their personal history, right? Before, you know, asking about their exes, their divorce or, you know, kids, et cetera, all that stuff. Uh, when it comes to sex, cause you just mentioned, right. I, and so in the book I say, wait for as long as you can stand it. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm saying a one I stand is bad. Hey, like I don't judge. Uh, and I think everybody should have a bit of fun, but if you're looking for a serious relationship, then you should wait for as long as you can stand it. And actually it'll be better. I totally, listen, I, I, I judge. I think that, like <laughs> people are just jumping into bed with any, but that's, that's because that's over taken over like relationships. Now people are not even having relationships. They're like hooking up. They're having situa situationships, yeah, situationships. Like to me, like we're, we're, we've lost the ability, like I said, to like truly connect with people because we're just, everything's becoming very transactional. Yeah. And I, I do find this to be like a big problem, but continue. And, and then I would say that like, for me, I had my best relationships when I was the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. And listen, all of our issues stem from childhood. And there's no such thing as perfect parenting, right? So I think the sooner yeah. you can understand your own issues and the emotional damage from right your childhood, and the sooner you can work on that, whether it's reading self-help books, whether it's listening to podcasts, whether it's getting therapy, which I'm a huge proponent of, then... And the sooner you can become the best version of yourself, you're like a mirror. You will attract, like you will attract the best partner that, that you can attract. Yeah, I, I agree with that, of course. I, but I, th there's been a lot of like backlash now with like, with, with in mental health. Um, I was just reading this article about people are now relying on therapy so much where then you're just focusing only on your problems. Have you seen any of this research? where it makes people actually, it's actually increasing the level of anxiety and depression because you're basically, you're constantly giving, um, this is not about the etiquette, but this is just yeah, this is super interesting. I found, I found really interesting. You're, you're kind of, you're kind of just giving so much focus and attention to all the things that you, your, the problems you have and labeling your problems as opposed to, um, how it used to be like even like 40, 30 years ago when I was a kid. Right. And so that's, and that, and that's part of the reason why the mental health crisis has been 
kind of getting higher and higher. besides of course the comparison and social media and right. all of the other stuff and the inability to, to socialize but also then we're becoming very self-absorbed and coddled where then we just become we're just focusing on ourselves 24 hours a day and it's actually becoming it's it's the pendulum has swung too, too far that is really interesting and i can see that i you can know? see that we are becoming very coddled so it's a fine balance yeah. and and it's a balance that you know i think i think we need to think critically for ourselves mm -hmm. You know, so, so much of his herd mentality and we just jump on and that, that's cancel culture too as well, right? It's 100%. like Everything just is jumping on high behind a screen, no accountability. What happened to thinking for yourself and, and thinking about what's important to you and thinking about what you want to do about it? You know, it's interesting that you just said that, and I'm going to now segue it back to your book, not even on purpose, but because that's what I noticed when I was reading it, you did, a, you said a couple things that were contrary to what I would think that you would have said. Like what? Um, I love being contrarian. By no, no, no. I, because I was, because you know, the whole like breaking up on text message for, that was one just easy example just to pull from because everyone's like, how it's not, it's not appropriate. How dare you? You're so rude. And so I, when I was reading this whole area about the dating and the relationships, and then you talked about actually breaking up with your boyfriend on a text message and how it's totally fine. And people should not be like saying that's bad ad etiquette. I was really impressed because of the reason behind it. Right. So I agree with you. I think that not everything has to be this way or that way because it's it's like it's a, it fits into a, a a nice box. So I love. Can you just tell the story? Actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure my ex boyfriend is cringing where sure he is right now. It. But well, yeah. Who knows? He blocked me, but he did. <laughs> and by the way, does that, obviously you changed his name, right? Or no, you didn't. Oh, obviously. Okay. I, I kept the first letter the same. So, so any, <laughs> any, any good anecdote, good story where it's a praise, I keep the real name. If it's a negative story, I change the name, but I keep the, the first letter as the same. So like, you know, yeah, Sarah B. Susie. A hundred percent. I love it. I love <laughs> it. I love that. Okay. So tell us why. Okay. So explain that. Okay. Because and, of, and of course, I mean, it was a New York Times style profile that came out in January, 2023. And when I, of course, they take the one thing that I say out of like a 36 hour, you know, of them shadowing me and they make that the headline. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Of course. They, well, that's Click of course. Yeah. Right. So when I saw it, I, I cringed. Uh, and then I sent it to my cousin, Adrian, who I'm, I'm closest with. And she, and when she saw it on, you know, she was like, OMG. Uh, and I was dying. And, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I really wanted to post it on Instagram or, you know, or social media because it's a New York Times style profile and I love the photo. And everything else about the article is great. And I was, I was like, ah. Oh. And then 10 minutes later, when Adrian finished, she finished reading the article. She was like, you know what? It's the perfect title. Because it talks about how etiquette is contextual. And so saying, you know, the etiquette guru who broke up with her boyfriend over text, like, it's contextual. And now I embrace the title. And yeah. that ex, his friend sent me the title along with comments like, what a title. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, actually, listen. I think it works because I think life is contextual, right? Everything in life is contextual. And if you are in a terrible relationship and you get the courage in that moment to do it, then just do it. The problem is, is it ever, like in your case, it obviously step, you know, stuck, but a lot of times we will go back and forth anyway. And it doesn't, well, you stick. know, we were on again, off again. Oh, okay. And, and cause he was in, I, I knew, you know, it, I was on how he was very insecure and controlling. And so I'm, I was, it was day nine of shooting my Netflix show. I was like, here I am telling my students to live their best lives. And over here I have this needy and controlling boyfriend who's making me cry all, all the time and show up on set with puffy eyes. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what? Like, this is it. Like we're done. And at that point, you know, I was maybe 34, 34 years old. And you think like, oh, it's some cost fallacy, right? We learned this in Harvard business school. It's like, oh, I invested four years in this relationship already. And I'm already this age. Like maybe, maybe I should just stay with it. Cause who knows? Like, it's hard to meet somebody right. these days. Literally, when I sent that text, I was prepared to be single for the rest of my life. I was like, I would rather be alone for the rest of my life than be in a relationship that makes me unhappy. I felt as free as a bird after just cutting it off. I, it was, and I think I needed something as an intense, as intense and overwhelming as a net, shooting a Netflix show mm -hmm. to push me to make that decision. Cause I literally didn't have an ounce, not even like a millimeter of space for anything that was not adding value to my life. Good. And then I spent the next eight weeks shooting my show, uh, went, flew back to China where I spent Christmas day and New Year's Eve in a 14 in a day hotel quarantine because it was COVID yeah, lockdown, yeah. all that stuff. Popped out of quarantine, had a first date with my 
with a with my now husband seven seven months later was legally wedded. Are and you I, kidding? I'm, I'm so happy. Like I every every day I thank my husband for being such an incredible husband to me. So supportive, so kind, so he, letting me be myself. Yeah. How did you meet him? We met years ago at some event that I hosted at one of my finishing schools. It, once you have a space, physical space, you always have to activate it. Yeah. So every week I'd have a couple events, non-etiquette related. Each event would be like 40, 50 people. And so he had my business card, but he never reached out to me until like, you know, 2023 yeah. <laughs> or no, 2022, 2022. Yeah. Wow. And then he went out and like, and like, what is he also similar to you or? He doesn't speak a word of English. Are you serious? <laughs> so I, you know, oh, right, you, I where feel does like he live. You say he lives. He lives. In he, lives he lives in Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai, right? And and I feel like I have this double life because I'm. I obviously I grew up very comfortable with the West. I went into I went to Phillips Exeter. Like I speak English. Yeah. Right? And but at the same time, oh, and I had to learn Mandarin. Uh, yeah. And then I went over there, and I and then I had to like open my etiquette school and teach customers who did not speak a word of English. I had to hire staff who didn't speak English, right? So I literally like. And, but I, I, I had to really localize. And to this day, that is one of the, my like achievements that I'm most proud of Yeah. that when I speak Mandarin, I speak it so fluently and with such an accent that the locals don't believe I'm not a local. Wow. Are you serious? That's like a, isn't that the most difficult language to learn? Yeah. One half. Yeah. It's really, really, really difficult. So so, and people would say, oh, what do you mean you're from Hong Kong? You must just have gotten Hong Kong passport. I'm like, no, no. Like I had to learn Mandarin later on in life. And they say, that's not possible because your Mandarin is too good. Um, so what languages do you speak then? English, Mandarin? English. I speak Cantonese because in Hong Kong, yeah. we grew up speaking Cantonese. Cantonese, yeah. I studied French and German. In Hong Kong, I went to a German school. So I speak German and French uh, and then Mandarin. So, so he does this. What does he do back in Shanghai? He's, he, so he, he, he does real estate. So yeah. this is what's interesting. Okay. So, okay. First of all, you didn't even, I didn't ask you yet. Cause I, I guess I was nervous at the beginning, <laughs> uh, not because of you, but because like how you're, you know, I'm just trying to mirror what you're, how you're sitting and all these little <laughs> things. How did you even get the Netflix show? Oh yeah. Let's Gosh. start with that. Cause oh. like, how did that even, like, how did they even know of you? I mean, you said there's a lot of like charm schools in the U S. Um, um, not, a, I don't know how many, right now, but back then it was a thing. But what happened was a production studio in based in Singapore that called Beach House Productions. They found me, they cold emailed me. They emailed my info at, you know, whatever email. Okay. In 2018. Oh. And and then asked me if they could pitch me as an idea to some streaming platforms and Netflix bought the show. So what and so what year did Netflix buy it? It was 2020. Well, before COVID, yeah, it was before COVID and we were supposed to go into production, but then COVID hit and then that put a spanner in the works. And then we ended up shooting end of 2021 in Sydney. And how many episodes did you do? Six episodes. So season one, six episodes. So then, okay. So then they, your partner, she didn't want to do the part the show with you or does she in the show um, or what's the. No, she, she's not on the show. She stayed in Rebecca. China. You know, she has a family in China and she, so she was just. She never expressed interest and Netflix never asked and it wasn't. So were you doing. If, if we shot in China, she'd probably be in it just because, right. Like it, it No, would've. no, it makes sense. But, but what, then at that time they could only get me a visa to go to Australia. Australia was very strict with COVID at that time. It was very strict. Even right. Australians couldn't get into Australia. I, I remember. Do you remember that whole thing? They were pissed. With Novak uh, with the tennis player. Yes. Djokovic. Yeah, right. Djokovic. But then, okay. So before you got the Netflix show. Yeah. Were, and I, I know you already had, you already had the finishing schools. Were you around doing expert? Like, were you doing? No, I was just in expert, China. You weren't an etiquette expert on like TV shows or doing anything. Oh, in China I was. In yeah. China, but not anywhere else. Yeah, I was, I was crazy busy just focusing on China, but I, I got a lot of overseas media interviews. So people are interesting. So yeah, people yeah. did kind of know who you were in this yes, space. Yes, yes. In 2013, Forbes, I was one of Forbes 12 women to watch. 2015 BBC, I was on their like list of 100 women. I mean, so how did they know of you? Like, how did this? Because it was, you know, really just word of mouth. Because I never, there was five years when I started my business, I never even came back to America because I was so busy. I was literally like, my weekends were the busiest. When people had time off was when I was busy. I was teaching all the time. I would fly all over China. So not just in our schools, but I would fly to 
or like Chongqing, uh, Xi'an, Fujian, all these places. I was doing like three cities a week to teach. And it was just, I mean, it, it was exhausting. So you were actually one of the people teaching at your schools. Like Absolutely. Some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're a boutique school and we don't have a lot. Of, we, we had three teachers. Uh, but we had a lot of like, we'd bring in a lot of experts, like styling experts. We'd have, uh, you know, well, Rebecca's, you know, a wine expert. We'd have, we have an art expert. So to all these to things. To teach their own modality, right? Yes, yes. So what would be your modality that you would teach? Um, well, the thing I love most is t Western table manners. Yes. That's what I absolutely loved. And it was probably the, one of the, yeah, like the highlight classes that the students really love too. Can you give, okay, so if you say, let's, yeah. because you just said table uh -huh. manners, like give me a few top th besides like do's and don'ts like yeah do's and don'ts like, but but not so obvious ones like the put like i know put the napkin on your lap yeah. like the way you say like double the napkin and give me some other ones that aren't so obvious that people do regularly that we should maybe stop doing yeah so don't hold your knife like a pen you'd be surprised right. how many people do that they hold their knife like a pen okay like this don't do this well, when you write, it's like, you'd be surprised. A lot of people hold their knife like a pen. Okay. How to, show us how to hold it. The way you held it is correct. Like this. Oh, really? Yeah. Versus? So versus like cutting like oh, this. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so, so I was right. See there, Amanda. I was yeah. right. There you go. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and, and, and so, okay. So here, here's something that people may not always know. So when you're at a restaurant, when, when the waiter gives you a menu and you've made your decision, you should close the menu. Because that is a signal to the waiter that you've already made your decision and he can approach you. If your menu still stays open, he thinks that you haven't made your decision yet. He thinks you're still deciding. Yes, that makes sense. And, and will not come by. Okay, that's a good one. And let's say you started eating, you picked up your cutlery, you started eating, and you want to take a sip of water, right? You need to put your cutlery down, but just as a rest, right? Then your cutlery should be in an upside down V shape on your plate. Upside down V shape. Like this is a V. Yeah. If your plate is round, it should be like this. Right. Cause that, that was the one thing I was going to say at the beginning. She would get so mad at me because where, where I place my cutlery after I eat. Like, D did you put it half on the table, half on the plate? That's a big no, no. I don't remember how, but she like screamed at me over no. it. I don't remember. How are you supposed to put your cutlery after you eat? Where, oh, where after you eat, it should be, they should be parallel, like right next to each other, parallel. And they should stay on the plate. And they can be like in a six o'clock. Okay, that sounds okay. I think that's what she said. Okay. And so, okay, give me a few other ones. Um, oh, here's a fun one. So when you, let's say if you're a woman and you have lipstick on, mm -hmm. right? And you're drinking from your wine glass. Mm -hmm. Well, you do not want to drink around the rim of your wine glass because that will leave stains all over your wine glass. and It'll just look really bad. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're just drinking from the same one place. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, another one you said, which I didn't realize, because this is, I think people do this all the time. When you are having a dinner, you're going to, you're sitting, you're sitting at a table. <coughs> people always assume that the host should get the best seat, but it's actually the guest that should get the best the seat. The guest of honor. Yeah. Well, yeah. If it's just, yeah, if it's just you two, the host and the guest, it should be the guest who should get the best seat. Best seat. Exactly. And so for example, Let's say if you're in a restaurant and there's a banquette, let's say there's like one, there's one chair that's with its back against the wall. Yeah. Let's yeah. say that, right. There's one, yes. let's say there's one chair facing a wall. There's one chair facing the room. Then the better seat is the one facing the room and you should give that to your guests. That makes sense. But how about what, at, at the head of the table? Should that not be the host? It depends if you're seating French style or English style. Mm. So let's say the table is rectangular and English style would place the host and hostess at the ends of the table. French style would place host and hostess at the middle of the of the long table. Oh, so there's so there's a difference between French style and English style. And usually, French style is reserved for a big party. So if it's like a twenty person dinner, or even more like a state dinner, right? If, if let's say King Charles is hosting a state dinner, then usually the host and hostess sit in the middle of the long table. That way, all the VIPs that sit near the host and hostess can speak to each other. And then the less important you are, the further away from the middle. You, you sit. And then English style is reserved for a small, like at home, for example, a dinner of six people, eight people, 10 people. And the host and hostess are at the ends of the table. And then the VIPs are next to them. 
And then the less important people are towards the middle of the table. So everybody feels cocooned. But this, this works for small dinners. I love that. Okay. Uh, I, so I didn't even get to any of my questions, but even like how you, you position your feet, right? I saw something that if your feet are in a V position, does that make it's, it, you, it your, your clothes, you're open? What does this mean? Yeah. Body language is a big part. Well, yeah. This is a nonverbal communication, right? So let's, so actually if I'm at a, if I'm, let's say at a gathering or a social function, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll sit or I'll, you know, stand with my hands like this and my palms facing up. Cause actually when you show your palm, it's, it's an open gesture. Okay. It's an open gesture. Whereas if it's like this, and this is a closed gesture, right? I mean, this, we all know. Right. Right. So, so even just small. And, and so if you're standing, if you're standing and you're like feet are all like tangled up, then that's kind of closed. But if you're, if you're like, you know, if your feet are relaxed like that, comfortable in ballet, it's the fifth position, right? right? The, the V and it's just an open, an, an open gesture. Is there any other, give me some other ones that people don't know in terms of body language. We, we all, we all know this one and this, give us some other ones that maybe are not so obvious. Yeah. Uh, you, so usually if you touch your hair, uh, okay, let's see. Think about it while I look at this other thing. Okay. Well, here, here's a fun thing that's history related. The history behind shaking hands, why do humans shake hands? It's to show that we don't have weapons in our hands. That that oh. like was the beginning of shaking hands. Toasting, toasting wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we just raise our glass, right? But back then people would really, you know, really like go at it and then wine would fly around into each other's cups. And why was that? To show that the host had not poisoned their guest's wine. That was the purpose of toasting. So why do we still do it? Do we need to? Because hundreds of years of tradition. And so, and, and, and now it's still, a, it's still a nice gesture to toast, to welcome someone or to kick off an event or to, you know, it's just to have that is nice. What do you think of a fist pump? Because I feel like now people are with not- With COVID. Yeah, with COVID, they're not shaking their hands. They're doing the fist pump. Yeah, and that's fine. But hey, listen, we just went through three years of the first ever kind of event in the world that affected literally the whole world. So we change with the times and etiquette should be updated with the times. So what are some things that have shifted and changed since you were young and that what you like, what are some things that are very current, um, etiquette wise since after COVID that were not part of the etiquette system or protocol before? Uh, so, I mean, the one that you just mentioned handshake is, is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I would say, so here's something funny in Asia, whenever you are sick, you wear a mask. That was always the case before mm -hmm. COVID. So if you see an Asian person wearing a mask, it usually means cause they, they're, they have a sniffle and they don't want to give it to you. Oh, okay. Very different from um, the West where it's like, okay, I'm going to wear it to pr protect myself. Right. In Asia, it was more of a sign of respect where I'm, I'm have a cold. I don't want to pass it on my office. Thus I'm going to wear a mask. Well, I thought though people in Asia were wearing masks for many, many years because they didn't want to get sick. Um, which I thought was kind of smart. At the time. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it definitely was not as widespread. And in, in China, at least it's more, you wear a mask because you were sick and you don't want to, and in Japan as well. You don't want to pass that on to somebody else. But now wearing a mask is much more commonplace. Now, when I fly around America, I see Americans. Wearing, you know, wearing mask. masks. Like, Do you wear a mask? Cause you know, uh, it depends. It, it really depends. I mean, I, when I flew back from New York to Hong Kong, I, on that flight, I got COVID and then I gave it to my dad who ended up in hospital <gasps> and he oh. made it okay. But after that, that made me a lot more careful. So if I'm about to see an old person and then I, then I try to, you know, protect myself so that I don't get anything to pass on to an old person. Yeah. That makes sense. So in terms of like etiquette for, you know, post COVID 2024 now, Give us some other ones besides a fist pump or, you know, is there anything you can think of? Well, I would say that if you are really sick, if you've come down with something, then it's better to excuse yourself from a social gathering than to show up coughing and sneezing all over the other guests. Yeah. I think it's also, also it's also a, oh, you'd be surprised, but it's also a really handy way to cancel last minute. Yeah, it's always like that in kids, you know, there's you got <laughs> exactly. So if, let's say like you want it, you're single, you don't have the kid excuse. I know you can use that excuse. Yep. You know, you can. 
Okay, this is what I wanted to ask you because uh, I'm a very curious person, right? Just by nature, not because the, I mean, the podcast is just an evolution of a natural thing for me to do considering I ask a ton of questions on a good day without a microphone. What is, what is your opinion, in your opinion, what is the difference between being curious and being intrusive? Mm. I think it's also contextual. If we were in Asia and somebody saw you and they said, oh, you've gained weight or, oh, you've lost weight or, oh, are you dating anyone out? When are you getting married? These are actually signs of care. Mm. And, and, and I, if, if let's say I saw a friend in China and the first thing said, oh, you've gained weight, I actually would not be offended. I would not be offended because it's a way of showing they notice you. Oh, yeah, yeah. They care, right? In the West, if they said that, my God, <laughs> yeah, you would yeah. be like slitting their throat and like, you know, in, in exactly. The people, yeah. And yeah, people either take it extremely personally or they would just think very poorly of you. Yeah, yeah. Right? And and so that's why it's very contextual. There, yeah. is, there is no right or wrong. It's contextual. See, the way I look at it is that you can get away with anything. If you, it's, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. I completely agree. And I say that in my book as yeah. well. And people think that etiquette is one big no. They think it's limiting. I have friends who tell me, oh, I, I have terrible etiquette. I'm too honest to have good etiquette. And I'm like, then you don't really understand the essence of etiquette. Right. right? And when, when I say it, etiquette should be empowering and enabling, you can get what you want. You can ask for what you want. You can set boundaries. You can go speak to the person you want to speak to. It's all about how you do it. See, that's exactly it. Like, so when I was, t- when I, like I was, when I was teasing about, you know, this whole I'm bad at etiquette, it was really what I was really referring to or like the table manners because my friend always bothers me about it because of the, those things or like the way, or just in terms of being very ladylike, like just even looking at you, you know, like I know you're going to say, well, I'm not, then you're not doing a good job, but that's not true. <laughs> I just think, is there some part of it like you, like, I feel like I'm a bull in a china shop. That's just my personality. I'm like, I'm more, I'm I'm like louder. I'm more aggressive. I'm more like, I'm more like, I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm more of a. It's it's also cultural, right? I mean, Americans are kind of known, uh, you know. I'm Jewish. (laughs) No, I'm not American. I'm Canadian, by the way. Well, North American on, I mean, it's kind of. (laughs) Exactly. That's true. Americans for sure. But also it's personality personality driven and you're right like American Canadian that's what I was saying like it would be really hard like I feel awkward when I'm too formal like I don't even know how to wear high heels properly without looking like a like a jerk off because I'm not walking (laughs) properly you know what I mean because I don't feel you you know myself and you know what's actually very funny is that when when I'm in China I come across as like much more strong more aggressive because I'm, but it's funny because in America, people may not necessarily say that about no. me, but in China I am. And, and that goes to show you again, like the contextual of it. Can, or you're a really good chameleon because you've learned to adapt because of your background and your training on etiquette. You know how to walk in and be, adjust. It, it's just, and it's adjust like subconscious. Yeah. You know, it's, it's even subconscious. And I remember like, so for example, I mean, when I'm in America, I speak with an American, my American accent comes out. But when I'm with an English person or somebody with a UK accent, then I sound more English. And in fact, when I read in my audiobook, I sound more English. And and only, and I always wondered, ah, oh, why do I do that? Like I can't even help myself. And what somebody told me years ago was they said, it's it's actually it's a form of good manners because you're trying to speak in a way to let the other person understand you better. Yes. Subconsciously. So you're subconsciously switching over to that. Absolutely. But I do notice that like my friends from London are so, they seem so much more pristine and, and cultured because of the way they, they speak and the way they sound. And also growing up in Europe, what happens is you get access, like you travel through Europe and you much more, you you do get more culture that way because you go to Italy, goes to Spain, you go to like London, you you fly around, you, you learn more about other people's nationalities and cultures, which then helps kind of refine you a little bit better. Also, UK culture, I mean, that it's, you know, silence is golden. Uh, so people like mm-hmm. quiet time. And, you know, there's a culture of never complain, never explain, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's very, it's very different. Whereas American culture is like, speak up for yourself, like if, complain if you want to, right? It's, 
Well, you said, hold on a second. I actually was going to tell you the talking cultures versus, versus, like, versus the listening culture. Yes, right? yes. So there is a big difference between that, right? Like, I like you said something. This is a great little trick because we were just talking about the art of silence in a conversation. You used to mute the phone when you were at, I guess. I still do. If I'm, if I'm not speaking uh, on the phone or on Zoom, I will mute myself. And only when the other person finished speaking, then I unmute. So my, my, my sort of resting face is mute, basically. Like I'm always on mute unless I'm speaking. That's a great tip because then you don't interrupt somebody. Yeah. And then you don't have any background noise, right? Like an ambulance passing by or if somebody's in the house, right? That you're not distracting the other person. Because if the other person on the phone, hears some distraction, they're going to be distracted. It's so true. And I'm, you know, if, again, these are things that common sense that you just don't realize in the moment until you get reminded. Because when you speak on the, when I talk to people and you can tell if I'm talking to my friend in New York or wherever, and I hear bustling on the streets and ambulances, yeah. like I'm, I'm annoyed because I can feel that they can't, how can they hear, hear and listen to me if I can hear all that noise? So that is a really good psychological thing to be do, trick because then the other person feels like they've been heard and listened to as well. Exactly. And it stops you from interrupting if you're somebody who interrupts a lot, right? Saying that for a friend. So that, so <laughs> we all have a friend we're saying that for. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> so then like, you could, let me add, cause I want to go back a bit. So because before you opened up these finishing schools, you went to Harvard business school, you went like, you're obviously a very business savvy, smart person. What would you have done by the way? If it wasn't for this, is there anything, did you, cause you went to, you were at Goldman Sachs, you said, right? No, so, I was at Perella Weinberg. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, so, so basically I interned for Morgan Stanley the summer of my, before my senior year in investment banking in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. When I graduated, I moved to New York city and I worked for Perella Weinberg, which was the two finder, founders, Joe Perella and Peter Weinberg. One came from Morgan Stanley. The other came from Goldman Sachs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then. That, like what would like what would you have done? Like were you gonna were you very entrepreneurial? Because I know now you have your own line of what do you call it? Uh, yeah, intimate wellness. Intimate wellness. W were you always someone who thought to be an entrepreneur to like start your own schools to do all these things, or were you going more of a corporate route? Like what was your plan? When I was graduating from Harvard Business School and trying to think about what I wanted to do, I basically narrowed my choice down by geography, mm. and I thought at that time. China was becoming, was at that point, a global power in 2012 mm -hmm. with a lot of eyes on China. So it was becoming the second power, you know, second to America. And it was very exciting. And I'd lived in Beijing as a volunteer for a nonprofit before I went to Harvard Business School. So I spent one year there. And I thought me as a Hong Kong Chinese person, I really wanted to go, you know, experience this and be part of China and see what I could do. Uh, and, and so that was how I made my choice. I never considered anything else. You know, I'm, I'm very much a here and now kind of person. I never really think about, oh, what would I be doing otherwise? Yeah. And in my mind, I was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it happen and it's going to work. So like, where else can you go with this, with being an etiquette expert? You wrote your first book. You have the show on Netflix. Um, are, are you going to do a, like, I would think, because this is my business brain, what you would have done would do a line of, you know, Martha Stewart. Yeah. Tableware stuff. Exactly. That's the obvious play, right? Yes. Yeah. Although in China, okay, so here's the thing. Everything I've done in, in my career has been across two realms. One is East meets West. The other one is female empowerment, helping women move through the world with confidence. Mm. And Great spin. I love it. That's and so, so good. <laughs> you know, and, and so two years ago when I was hanging out with my friends, now co-founder for my, for anti Vorta, my intimate wellness business. Uh, when we're hanging out and we were thinking, you know, we want to do something that we're really passionate about and that can, can, that, you know, can bring the best of Chinese culture and traditional Chinese medicine, which actually is her family business. So she's Taiwanese. Her grandpa founded his first traditional Chinese medicine TCM clinic in Taiwan in the 1940s. Oh. That's operating to this day by her cousins. So it was passed down because it's her maternal grandmother and Taiwan's very patriarchal. So it's always passed down to the son and the son's son. And so she grew up with this, you know, in her family business. She went to U Chicago, so she's very Americanized like me. And then she moved to Shanghai and she 
Uh, she worked for some very exquisite luxury women's wear brands where she was CEO. So she was CEO of Stella McCartney for Asia Pacific oh, for wow. five years, managing hundreds of people. Wow, these are Stella McCartney. I know. I actually noticed that. Oh. <laughs> and then and then she was CEO of Asia Pacific for Diesel Jeans for uh, as, as well. And when we were meeting up, and actually even before that, she was GM of Shanghai Tang, which is gorgeous, exquisite Chinese brand. It was what under Richemont. Shanghai Tang. Shanghai oh, Tang. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that was her, where, you know, she began early days and, and, and then she, we were sitting down and we've always exchanged TCM wellness tips. And she's like, you know, I'm so, I'm, I'm so bored at my job. I'm not learning anything new. I, I don't feel like I'm doing something that's meaningful to me. I really care about life sciences. She got a PhD in neuroscience, by the way. She sounds like a real loser this week. <laughs> yeah, and right. she's 5'11". Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. What's her name? Annie, Annie. Annie Ho. Oh, my God. Okay. So, so and you know, me being it, going to my sort of etiquette makeover mode, I was like, then, I was like, well, if you don't like your life, then do something. Then change your career. Do something that's meaningful to you. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, yeah, that's a good idea. What do you think I should do? <laughs> and... And then, and then as we were thinking about this, like what we both loved, what we were passionate about, what we grew up with, we grew up with herbal remedies, her because of her family business, me, because in Hong Kong, you know, I grew up with acupuncture, herbal soups, all these things, because my parents were really into it. Right. And, and, you know, and, and then, and then she, and, and we were, we realized that like in TCM, a woman's health begins in her ovaries. So a, your female reproductive health system, it, it like, that's like that is the most important thing. And if that's good, then the rest of your body is good, basically. So like, not like in the US, it's about the gut, the microgon. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. This is different. Very different. Yeah. And you know, it in in the East, it's about prevention. The West, Western med so Eastern medicine is about prevention. Western medicine is about treatment. Mm -hmm. It's about that quick fix, instantaneous, mm -hmm. which I think is a fundamental problem. In, in, in how we approach health mm -hmm. in the West. Mm -hmm. And I've grown up with both and I use both. So for example, you know, two months ago I did the Pranuvo scan and it was amazing. Yeah. Right. But like I also get my weekly acupuncture and cupping and all that stuff as well. Right, right, right. Even when I'm traveling. You said that. You said it helps your traveling. Yeah. And it helps me stay regular on my menstrual cycle because the acupuncture does. Acupuncture does. Yeah. It's it's the only thing that and in fact this morning I met a, uh, I was at a beauty store and, and, and the, the girl behind the counter was also telling me she does acupuncture every week. Cause it's the only thing that, and she's white, never been to China. Right? And really? she was saying, it's the only thing that keeps her, that keeps her regular. And a Georgetown girlfriend of mine who I saw in New York, she said that when she was 34, she, she stopped her, her she didn't have a period for a year. She wow, decided yeah. to go see an acupuncturist. It came the next day, the next really? day, the next day. So, I mean, it, like it's, and now acupuncture for women trying to conceive for oh, fertility it is like one of it's like the number one thing every woman in america is doing now in, in europe for fertility right so i mean also they say nad is very helpful do you know what nad is um it's like that western chemical it's, it's like basically a molecule it's basically your body stops producing it as you age is that the like so it's the longevity thing it's for yeah yeah, yeah behind you actually called trinigen but that uh, wasn't actually yes. I've i heard wasn't of this. i wasn't yeah i've heard of it i've heard of trinigen yeah it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic um they basically it's the precursor which means that you take it and it helps your body produces nad but it, i wasn't bringing it up to promote them even oh, i yeah, was yeah. actually bringing it up because there's all this research you're talking about fertility infertility there's so many people who've said that when they started to uh, take NAD, like either through an IV or through supplements or whatever, it is literally was like the, the switch that made them wow. be able to, yeah. That's why when you're saying that it's a huge, huge, huge thing. Interesting. Yeah. And there's a woman named, she's like called a fertility egg whisperer, a oh. Dr. Amy, I don't remember, but I'm digressing, but yeah. Yeah. So for Very women out there who are, yeah, NAD, trinogen is like, in, it, it's been shown in tons of clinical trials. So yeah. Anyway, that wasn't what we we're talking about, yeah. but I wanted just to, you were saying yes, about acupuncture. Yes, right. What else is acupuncture in your opinion really good for? Not because so, so the top three things that Americans go to acupuncture for are mental health, mm -hmm. where you put, so whether it's sleep or migraines or just anxiety, you put the needles in the head yeah, and you will sleep like a baby. Like it, needles in the head that night will make me sleep so well. Really? The second thing Americans go to acupuncture for is digestion, so mm -hmm. digestive issues. Honestly, all that ice, drinking cold things is not good for your digestive system. That's why I brought my flask of hot water. 
right? Even Europe- Europeans do not drink stuff with ice. I could not agree with you more. I can I'm always about room temperature or yeah. hot too. Yeah. There's something, what, what is the, there's like also uh, Ayur, uh, Ayur, Ayur, Ayurveda. Ayurveda. Yeah. Ayurveda. Yeah. Also thousands of years of history, of just history like TCM. Being, right. Because I, I'm, a, I'm so on this train with you, I think, cause that's so much more for your digestive system. Like cold, like I feel like it shocks it, your system. It shocks your system. And it, if, if you want to go to the bathroom, do number two in the morning, the first thing you should do is drink a big glass of hot water when you wake up. So I drink room temperature water with lemon, but maybe I do you think it would be even more effective yes, to do hot, hot water. Like that helps your digestive system going. So what I do is I drink, a, I drink hot tea after my hot, my, my room temperature water. Yeah, that's good too. That's great. What is the difference? Cause I know that you always talk about the, well, not always, but like the water with the yeah. hot water and ginger cause for digestion. What about mint? Isn't mint supposed to be like hot water with mint leaves? Is that not good for digestion? No, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's good too. Ginger is it, ginger has warming properties. It's particularly good for women. Oh, okay. And, and so it's so and it's also just good to get your energy going. How much ginger are you putting in there? Because I don't I think put I put three it slices. Oh, that's three, it. Three thick slices is fine. You can you can adjust as much as you want. The only thing is, don't take ginger at night because it'll affect your sleep. Because ginger get it, it actually helps your circulation. So for particularly for people who have who get cold easily, who have yes, cold me. hands, cold feet, in or in the winter time. Like the first thing in the morning, you have ginger and you can have it up to maybe like afternoon, but in the evening, don't have too much ginger. It'll affect your sleep because it gets your metabolism going, right? So does it, it? Yes. Ginger does. It gets you, that's, that's how it warms you up. So this is, I mean, you're not even an acupuncturist or a doctor, but oh, this is this. like, this is like the most basic thing that all Chinese people know about, about, about foods. TCM, there's a diet therapy and you know, each food, whether it's cooling or he, he, uh, or, or warming and what exactly what it does to your body. So that's why you walk around with the flask of hot water, which I'm going to now start. That's a great one. Yeah. And so you're taking the skin off the ginger, correct? No. You don't? I'm lazy. You could just put it in like that? I mean, you wash it. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then just stick it in. It's easy. So it's great. I mean, ideally, if you're at home, you could put three slices of ginger in a pot of hot water and you boil it. And that really like, you know, gets the Stimulates good stuff it. out. But Hey, if I'm like, I'm on the go. I'm right. If I'm staying in a hotel, like I, I don't have time to do that. So, but the most important thing is the hot water. No, I agree with you. The hot water is like the key, the key, the cold. I don't ever understand like people. I have ice with this. I in the that? winter, like the I just winter. came from New York city. Like, I mean, all this iced water in the winter. <laughs> I know. I, I, I don't understand that. So then, okay, go back. So you and your, you and your girlfriend decided that well, you said everything starts with your ovaries. Right. And I'm, and I'm, I'm coming t- back in, to in traditional Chinese medicine, you yes. know, your feminine I didn't forget health, about your product. Don't worry. <laughs> your feminine yeah. health is, is very important. And even your period is a report card of your health. Are you regular? Do you have blood clots? Have your life flow? Are you entering early menopause? Right. That's what you asked me when you walked in here about, you're like, oh, when you're, when we're talking about traveling yeah. about, my, about my menstrual cycle. So if, cause I, I'm pretty on time all the time, but like, what that's very say, good. Is it, what does that mean? You're healthy. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> and so if you're, if you're always irregular, what does that mean? You're unhealthy. And so you have, and, and then in that case, I mean, if you're always irregular, then you go to a TCM doctor and you figure out why. So then, because so you're so you, that's I was asking you because of this product too. So then, what, yeah, what were you? Oh, okay. So so what we wanted to do was we wanted to create, we wanted to, we wanted to come out with a product that was rooted in traditional Chinese medicine, which is twenty five hundred years of history, and that makes me and Annie happy and healthy, and be able to share that with the world through our brand anti water, which in Roman mythology means goddess of the future. So we have four SKUs. We have our cleansing gel, which is basically, you know, what you use in a shower, right on your vulva. We don't believe in douching. Everything is external for the vulva. So we have our cleansing gel. We have our spray in two different sizes. And then we have our intimate wipes, which are individually packaged and biodegradable and flushable. So th- it's a daily care bundle because we're focused on preventive. We're all about prevention. And this daily care bundle, it helps you fight odor, irritation, and dryness. And is it out, is it out in the marketplace? Yes, now? we just launched in the states two weeks ago on oh. our dot com. Oh, so you're not selling, you're not brick and mortar yet. You're just 
Uh, we don't have our own brick and mortar stores yet. No, 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 no. But you're not selling. Where would it be brick? I guess there's no way to put. I guess is it like goop or where? Where do people? Yeah, no, we would love it. And in fact, before coming here, I literally just like I I went to some boutique, sort of high end boutique independent retailers, or that I felt were aligned with our brand, and dropped off pitching sets. Really? Yeah. So how much is this product? What's this? What's the price point? Uh, Oh, we range. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the most expensive item is our cleansing gel, which is our hero product. And that's 33 US dollars. And then our sprays, we have two sizes. So the big at-home spray is $29. The pocket spray is $31. So what, you spray your vulva? vulva? Yeah. Vagina? Or like exactly. Yeah, no, totally. You you turn it upside down and you, you know, four inches away and you spray your vulva. And it the pocket spray is actually a great hit for people who like going to the gym. You know, they go to yoga have lunch with a girlfriend afterwards, but don't have time to shower. It also works as a great deodorant. A lot of our customers have been using it under their arms as well. And these are all free of harmful ingredients, all formulated with traditional Chinese medicine, clean, vegan, everything over here. Are you leaving this with me or no? <laughs> well, you know what? I will. I'll leave you the set. Well, no, I don't want you. Don't, don't do it <laughs> on the spot. But I feel like this is like a great thing. I'm going to try this stuff. Why not? Right? Yeah. I love it. Do a post an Instagram story for me and tag tag the I, tag the handle anti water laboratories. I will. So like, how did you? I will. Who who helped you formulate this whole thing? Well, Annie is our chief scientist. She's our CEO. I'm CEO and creative, and then she is our COO and um and uh and she's head of product. She's head of formula. This is like when we travel to the factory. I'm on the plane watching Netflix. I'm looking at her. She's reading research journals about different ingredients. Wow. So who is like, who else is doing this now? Is there a lot of competition? We're actually the first intimate wellness brand to be formulated with traditional Chinese medicinal herbs to be, to be inspired by TCM. There are some femcare brands. Like, I remember like when I was a kid, I would see commercials for like Summer's Eve. Do you remember them? Yes. And the douching company. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, and they're still around and, but they I, are. I, they are around, and I, but I, listen, I would just say whatever you buy, especially for sensitive skin, which is yeah, no, down no, there, no. check the ingredients. Oh my God, for sure. Yeah. I mean, this is what I like. It's like all natural. I mean, listen. It's all natural, yeah. This, this is amazing. Not exactly the, et- I mean, is it proper etiquette to talk about feminine hey, listen, hygiene? It, it's about helping women move through the world with confidence. And you would be surprised that, okay, so there's this book and it's called Everybody Lies and it's written by a Google engineer. And he says, everybody lies if you ask them face to face, but Google search never lies. Okay. Yeah. The most Googled body part by men is, you can guess, penis size. The most Googled body part by women is vaginal odor. Really? I was shocked. Vaginal odor. And young girls who feel crippled by their vaginal odor and and feel like, well, literally like, I mean, it's girls of every age. And That's the number one Googled body part. And it's in a book called Everybody Lies. You can tell sex with Emily that. <laughs> I will. That is, I'm going to ask her. I'm gonna actually going to ask her after yeah. this episode. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So is that is that also part of the, re- when you did like your like market research, if this is going to do it, like if, if this is a viable option, you must have taken that into account. Yeah. I mean, of course, of course, but- but, you know, for us, I mean, it, it like, even when I do with etiquette, I, f- I feel that so much of the media today is telling us you shouldn't care, right? You shouldn't care about, anti-aging is a bad word now, mm-hmm. right? You, should, you shouldn't care that you're aging, but we do, right? The media is saying you shouldn't clean your, your, your vagina or your vulva, but actually you should, like, but we, and, we, and we do because, you know what? Who says we shouldn't do that? A, a, lot, of, a lot of people say we should not clean it. And a lot of people say that you should just use water, but here's the thing. Back in the day when we walked around buck naked, right? Like, okay. But now we're wearing Lululemon all day long. We are on Western medication, which messes with our hormones. We're traveling long haul, which also messes with our bodies, stress, alcohol, all these exercise, all these things will affect your, your microflora. And your pH levels. Yeah, totally. Makes sense. So you should clean your vulva. Are you saying vulva because it's a less... No, uh, vulva is the external. The vagina is internal. We don't promote douching. 
Right, so you don't promote douche, and that's why you keep on saying. P- it. People yeah. refer to whole areas vagina, but actually, but those wipes don't you wipe everything? Like, yeah, but you can't go up into your vagina. Up into your vagina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I guess you're right. Oh my gosh, this is fun. this is not where I thought the conversation was going with the manners expert. Okay, like this was like the antithesis of what I thought we were going to be talking about. Oh my gosh, I love it. Okay, well, I mean. I have one other area I want to talk to you about. What time yeah, is it? What God time? knows it's like Ooh, forever. Okay, one twenty-five. <laughs> okay, one question. Well, not really one, but feng, you have a, you're big into feng shui, and I yes. want to know about it. Yes. And <laughs> because we're talking about vaginas and vulvas, I didn't even ask you about that. Can you c- talk about that? Yeah. Well, so for example, you know your office set up here. You need to help me. The good thing is that your back is against a wall, and you are facing out onto the room and to the window. Because the wall is is what we call a kao shan. Kao is support. Shan is mountain. And when you sit, you want a wall behind you because that's your supporting mountain that protects you. The worst is to have your to have your desk up against the wall where you're facing the wall, right? And if you're facing the wall, it's like you have it, it inhibits growth because it's I mean you're looking at a wall. Yeah. And then you're back. You're defenseless because your back is to the room. Your back is to the window. Yeah. Now, one thing I would say, instead of a glass table, you should have a wood table because glass is transparent. It's not solid enough if it's a working table. Wood or just something that's like, you know, that that's not transparent. Why? Because what would, it would be best? Um, it, so it's, I mean, glass, like it. you want your work desk to be a place of security and of productivity and wealth, right? Bringing in money. And, right. And- in fact, we say the best work desk is something that even covers over the side so that when somebody, when you're sitting at it, people can't see your legs. Really? Like, Will I make more money if I have a, if I have a wooden table that does not show my legs? Well, you'll have to test it out and let me know. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Does it count that the, that the two pieces are wood that the glass is on top of? Yeah, well, no, well, it, it, this is the most important piece. That's the most important. Okay, yeah. Nick, can you give me some other main things about feng shui? Because, like, this room is like a smorgasbord because I was in the middle of designing it and then I stopped. Like, this was was a my husband's mom's that they left here and I'm trying to get rid of it, but it's comfortable. So I keep it because I actually like to sit in it, but it's the most ungodly looking thing in the entire world. Well, it's a lazy boy, everybody. I, they're, they're so <laughs> ugly, but they're so comfortable. Okay, in this room, I would say your TV is too high and that shelf is a bit high and it creates pressure, especially if you're sitting down. Yeah, I never watch it, but what do you, what do you but mean? But just the placement of it. It's like looming over you. So what does that mean? Uh, it, it creates pressure. So it's it's like added burden. So what is, but can you explain what that means in like my term? Okay, yes, terms? yes, yes. So, so, so I have a TV, but I'm not really using it. So what does it do when I'm in here? Oh, if you're not using it? Um, well, or I mean, yeah, I'll I use it when I'm in my sauna, like in my little portable sauna, I'll sit back here and watch TV. Well, that's fine. But just in terms of like, I mean, you want to be in the power position, right? So when you're sitting at your desk, you ideally are the highest thing. Like, yeah, in terms yeah of height. I got you. So oh. if you have this TV, like just look at a TV right now. Don't you feel it's like looming over you and about to fall on you? Not until you said it, but okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's so much higher than you. Yeah. That it creates like, like I ideally you could maybe put this on a lower shelf. Maybe half the height. And okay. And that, but, but I guess my question about feng shui is what, what is feng shui in the real term? Like, how does it matter in your life? Like it's okay, other, okay. other than just aesthetics. Okay. Like, yes. Okay. So that doesn't, I hate the couch. I, I don't like this. This glass maybe should be wood because it represents more money. But in the grand scheme, what is the purpose of it? So feng means wind, shui means water. So feng shui is wind, water. Okay. Every feng shui master, if let's say you want to stop arranging the feng shui in your house, the first thing they do is they find out your birthday. So your date of birth and your time of birth, because a lot of it is very customized. And let's say like your home, you have you, your husband and your children, then usually you provide all the birth dates to them while they're like, you know, calculating which spaces are what. But this room, for example, <laughs> is just you. So it's just more about you. Uh, feng shui can be applied <coughs> to, 
feng shui can be applied to your, it can help your love life, your career. It's about maximizing. It's about making the good things better and making the bad things, like minimizing the, the, the negative effects basically. So, so it's about arranging your furniture in a way that feels comfortable. If something is good feng shui, it will feel good. Cause again, this is the chi, this is the energy. And so people, people usually go to a feng shui master when something bad happens in their life, uh, find out their partner's cheating. Uh, they're maybe they just got divorced or, you know, break up, uh, something got, just got fired maybe, right. Something not going well at work, a deal just fell through. That's usually when people will turn to feng shui because something happened and they need help. And then usually we do feng shui. Feng shui is only like if you like feng shui, generally speaking. So for example, you know, the placement of your desk, you want it to be in a good position where you feel safe, you feel strong, you feel powerful, right? These things are evergreen. But if you want to go to the detail of, okay, put a, um, you need water in this corner. So you have like some moving fish tank or you want to put red curtains here, blah, blah, blah. That feng shui lasts only 12 months from Chinese New Year in January, February to Chinese New Year the next year. So usually every year, because, you know, it's a different year, like it would be year of the ox, year of the tiger, year of the rabbit, right? Right now it's year of the dragon. And so based on each year, details of the feng shui changes, but the general feng shui of like, okay, the, 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 the placement feels good generally, that's evergreen. That is interesting. I felt like also it gives a room a certain feel. Like you walk into a room and feel if there's a good feeling, a bad feeling. Absolutely. Like I'll walk into I'll know like, okay, you know, you, this is, this is a jagged edge or this feels blocked. I mean, but also that's like, like what did you feel I, when you walked in here? Well, I mean here, everything's been pushed aside in order to do the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I haven't seen it when it normally is, but you know, I mean, it feels, it feels cozy. It feels bustling, maybe a little bit, um, yeah, I like the I, the main thing for me is that the TV is too high. You didn't look, notice the ugly couch behind you? Yeah, but I mean, you know, it blends into the wall. It <laughs> does. Okay, well that's good. I mean, feng shui isn't about like the aesthetics. It's not about the aesthetics. It's not about like oh, like you know, it's 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 about the the feeling of everything, the harmony of everything together. So, for example, we'll say avoid sharp corners if you want harmony in the family then go for rounded corners for let's say your dining table or it can be a rounded a rounded corner or it could be a round table right so the, interesting if you if you want to do feng shui let's let's say you're single uh then make sure that you you know, you can put some pink in your room that attracts that's like peach blossom color that attracts <clears throat> love uh and then you want to have everything in your bedroom be symmetrical so if you're single and you're looking for a relationship, the last thing you should have is a single bed. You should have a, you should have a double bed, <coughs> which invites space for somebody into your life. You should not have your bed pushed up against a wall. You should have space on both sides for somebody to enter. You should not have just one nightstand. You should have a pair of nightstands, right? Again, symmetrical. So kind of act as if. Yeah. I love that. You don't want your closet to be totally like completely packed you want to leave a little bit of space for somebody else to put their clothes in are there three key rules of feng shui or uh i can give you three key rules of feng shui <laughs> sure do that and we'll wrap it up because god knows it's been forever i <laughs> for you uh let's see three what are some three good rules um well so i'd say rule one rounded corners are preferred over sharp corners right that that's one thing uh <laughs> although it's actually okay for for a work desk to have sharp corners okay yeah Good. um rule number two i mean let's see do we want to go with living room or with oh no uh no no disturbing art in the house and i say this in my netflix show because you don't you don't want to bring that energy into the home yeah number three Never put the bones or ashes of a loved one or a pet inside the home because it turns the house into a graveyard. It gives it too much yin energy. You'd be surprised at how many Westerners do that. You would be shocked. One of my students in my Netflix show did that. First of all, she like buried all the dead fish in their garden. And then when I said that's a big no-no, she a day later she was like, you know how you said that was a big no-no? I have a question. I have my dad's ashes in my bedroom. Oh. No. 
<laughs> He's just like, and I was like, oh my God. I was like, can we turn the cameras on right now? Wow, <laughs> I was exactly. Like, I was like, oh my God, did you guys catch this? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not, no, no, no. I agree with that. That's okay. Um, okay. I have all these other questions, but maybe you can just come back because I have so many things I didn't ask you, <laughs> like practicing non-sexual flirting. Oh yeah, that's fun. By the way, I have about like 10 minutes left. Is that okay? Yeah, no, no. I have another to podcast. Yeah, okay. I have a podcast too. That's what I, I, By the way, look, I have like another person coming, so that's, I, I feel like, that, like I, we got. It's been so fun. This yeah, has been really so fun. fun. Um, I wanted to talk to you about. Let me just pick one more yeah. thing. Oh God. Well, well, I know we didn't talk about, but I said it to you before. I love this, the twenty second rule or the forty second rule. Please talk about that. Yeah, and because I think this can be a game changer for a lot of people. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Do you have some people you want to name and shame? Yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> if I want to name, but I, I feel bad shaming them because sometimes you just are like, are like just completely oblivious. It's usually men, by the way. A, a lot of men are very oblivious to this, but I think it can save a lot of relationships and just overall like communication. If people listen to this, this is a really great one, guys. Listen to this. I like to think of dialogue as uh, traffic lights. So if you're speaking, if you stay within 20 seconds, green light, you're in the clear. If you're approaching 40 seconds, orange light, like you're edging on boring. And if you've gone over 40 seconds, red light, you're officially self-obsessed. I love that. The only issue I have is what if you're telling a story? Oh, that's different. That's different. I'm talking about like a conversation. I'm not talking about if you're up on the podium giving a speech or if you're telling a story, which requires. No, like- but I think a lot of times people drone on and on about these stories <laughs> and, pe- and they have no awareness of that it's boring for people. So then I guess my question is where are the, pro- like, when do you know, like, yeah, if you're doing it, if you're on a podium giving a speech, of course you're going to be longer than 20 seconds or 40 seconds. But when you are, just in a conversation at dinner or a dinner party, are you allowed to go past 20 seconds? If someone asks you a question, 20 seconds is really short. Yeah. Um, well, if somebody's asking you a question which requires a lengthy answer, like then you just have to be the judge of that, right? You have to be the judge of that. And also usually like that's why I think it's important to get out there and go to as many social functions as possible and to meet different people. What I love about the 20 second or 40 second rule when speaking to somebody is more than just it being 20 seconds on the dot or 40 seconds on the dot. It makes you think and be kind of, uh, you're, you're, you're being conscientious of how long you're talking about yourself. That to me is the importance of it versus just like, you know, droning on and on and on without any idea that there should be like a beginning and start, you know, beginning, middle and end time that should be concise. Cause otherwise people will just go on and on and it could be three minutes and you're sitting there and you're like, Holy shit, this yep. person is just talking forever. Yep. So just be mindful. I think it just makes people yes, mindful. It's true. It's less about counting the seconds and more about like, okay, like I know I should be mindful. And for me, if I'm ever on the receiving end of somebody who just keeps droning on, 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 what I like to do is I'm already thinking, cause I have a short attention span yeah, <laughs> and too. I'm already thinking like, how do I get out of here? Yeah. And, and if there's other people nearby, I'll just introduce them to somebody else, which yes, yeah, some people be like, that is so immoral of you to push this person onto another person. But it's like, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be Miss Goody Two Shoes. Right. And I, so I'm not teaching morals. I'm, I'm Miss Manners with a touch of Machiavelli. I love that. So that is exactly it. So your manners with a touch of Machiavelli, because I agree with you. Like, I don't think it's rude. What I think is actually you're being very, you're, you're, you're being very conscientious of the other person's feelings. You don't want to be rude and just walk away with not giving them another person to talk to. You're actually finding a replacement so you can get the hell out of there, <laughs> exactly. which is what I do on a regular basis. And I've mastered this. By the way, now after talking to you, I think I should be writing a, a, a manners book. I do because it. I think a lot of this is just like having a lot of like social experience yeah. and putting it in a book and telling somebody, you know, these are like some rules that you should abide by and it will make your life a lot easier to kind of navigate really. But 
but you do it much better and you do it in a much more <laughs> eloquent way than I would ever be able to. And I, like I said, I love the book. Um, everybody who, who's anybody who's listening, guys, the book is called mind your manners. I'm going to let her get out of here. She's the subtitle. Um, we oh, get yeah. the subtitle, how to be your best self in oh, any situation. How to be your best self in any situation by Sarah Jane Ho. She's the same lady that has the Netflix show by the same name, mind your manners. And like I said, you guys can just like peruse the book in one section, put it down is on you got dating in there. You have table manners. You have work situations, how to like properly respond to an email on time. By the way, how long, how, what's an appropriate amount of time? That to, some, oh, to, just to launch an email? an email? Ideally by end of day, but longest 24 hours. Work-wise. Oh, work-wise, work-wise. Actually, there's data that suggests people need expect a response within an hour, but at minimum end of day. Yeah, I still even think that's that's a lot. But um, anyway, Sarah, where can people find more of you? Are you on social media? Yes, my Instagram is Sarah Jane Ho. And uh, yeah, check out my Netflix show. And watch the Netflix show, guys. I'm sure, I, I watched a couple episodes. It was cute. You're very good on it. <laughs> you really are. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. And good luck with the book. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. And good luck with your um, intimate care female anti -borta. Yeah. Everybody anti -borta. should, everybody with a vulva should get one. Everybody who knows somebody with a vulva can get them one. <laughs> <laughs> and I will definitely, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try it and post it and great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.